thank you very much for having me today. I'm really excited. I'm really interested in ideas, and I always have been. Um, and I'm really interested in the way the world works, and I guess that's one of the things that prompted me to do engineering as an undergraduate, because I was interested in science, but I also wanted to put things together and be able to build things. And I know exactly which of you already in the audience have an engineering and science background. <laughs> Um, the reason I chose to do foresight in postgraduate study was because I was dissatisfied with not knowing how those things that we build made sense in a broader context and in the future of, or in the direction of where we wanted to go. So I come with a, with a bit of a bizarre mix of engineering and, and foresight, which is all about ideas. And we are hearing a lot of ideas today, and we are also hearing about how people are acting on those ideas and putting those ideas into action. And I don't think that's enough. I actually think that between the idea and what we do with the idea, we need to create better stories. We need more compelling visions of the future. Things that tease out those ideas in better ways so we're able to be a little bit more creative. Now, Steve's given us a challenge um, as speakers today to start to think way beyond. Um, and as a futurist, the, the time scale of way beyond is a tricky one because it can't be just 10 years into the future or even 40 years into the future because that's what I do in my normal job. We're always thinking 10 to 40 years in the future. So for me, thinking way beyond it comes to mind thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Deep time. And whenever we've done workshops with people about how they think about themselves in the future, the one question always comes up. What will it mean to be human in a thousand years? What will it mean for our experience of being human? And when we look at clues from the present and we look at some of the biggest issues we're facing, and one of those being diversity, biodiversity loss, it's not hard to imagine that maybe we will be the cause of our own extinction and we may not even exist in thousands and thousands of years. So how do we make change for the better and how do we start to live more sustainably so there is something about being human in that long, deep time? Well, at my house, this is my house, we've already made changes. We've changed our light bulbs, like all of you will have, I'm sure. A couple of months ago, we put solar panels on the roof to complement the wind energy. And in South Australia, it's not hard to um, go very quickly towards a renewable energy process. We've planted the beginnings of yet another vegetable garden. I have to say our success isn't high, but we've got high hope for the tomatoes this year. But it's not a very exciting story, is it? It hardly grabs us and says we have to do something better for the future. So what are the other sort of stories we're telling ourselves around sustainability? Rachel Botsman spoke at TEDx Sydney earlier in the year about her concept of collabor co uh, collaborative consumption. Um, and what she was talking about was that it's no longer the stuff that matters, it's our experience of the stuff. And so it's important to be able to have those experiences, but be able to pass on the stuff as a way of being more sustainable. And I really like what they've done because they've managed to develop a process for sharing the book that they've written. So you no longer have to buy the book. You can get it from somebody else, you can pass it on. A really good example of, of collaborative consumption in action. The, the other thing that we personally in my house find, found quite inspiring was the idea of the 100-mile diet. You know, so th this was a book written a couple of years ago by a couple in Vancouver who spent a year only eating what they could from with a 100-mile radius of where they lived. Now, in Vancouver, that's a bit challenging. You know, wheat, sugar, all of those things are fairly hard to come by. We, we've tried doing this in Adelaide, it's actually very easy. There's an enormous amount of fresh fruit and vegetables, wheat's not far away, a lot of honey to replace your sugar with. The only thing that you really need to worry about is tea and coffee. <laughs> so we didn't survive the full year, but also it's another um, aspirational image of the future. Of course, as well as those aspirational images, there are those that try to send shivers down our spine. And on August the 21st this year, the Global Footprint Network said that this was the time of the year when we'd already used up all of the resources that the Earth could reasonably generate within a year. We'd already used it up. So we want to push that out to December 31st. We need to become much, much more efficient. And you know, one of those ways of becoming efficient is doing things like replacing our energy needs. So in your little packets, you've all got a little LED. Pull it out. A little light. Um, this is actually a semiconductor. It's a very efficient form of light. Um, and it's currently being used to replace traffic lights and a whole lot of other lights within the community. I've got my little torch there just to show you. Um, so in another way, this is another story of sustainability for the future. It's another story. Is it the only story in this little object, though? I don't think it is. And I wanted to use this object to explore a range of stories, a myriad of stories that exist within this one simple object, to then ask ourselves, why do we not explore the multiplicity of truths that exist within more complex objects and more complex ideas? 
So at the very basic level, this is a circuit, or it will be if you turn it into this. Um, so if you want to make that now, because I know you're all dying to, those of you who haven't, it's quite easy. You just take the battery out of the packet, push it all out, um, you put your LED over the top of it, you'll see that it only works in one way, and we've already then learned something about, about how this technology works, so make sure your pins are around the right way. I'm going to give you all the instructions and then I'm going to let you catch up. <laughs> you take the two sticky dots, you put one on either side to um, secure the LED pins to your battery. Tease apart the paper clip because you want to be able to pin it onto your lanyards or something afterwards and put the paper clip on one of the sticky dot sides and on the other side you've got a little sticker just to make it look nice. So I'll let you all put that together. Help your neighbour if you need to. When you've got it, just hold it up. I want to take a photo of you. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> you've made my morning. <laughs> so what you've just done is what we've done with a whole lot of students with some of the work that we've done at Flinders University in South Australia and with teachers who are teaching high school students around science and technology. And we've used that little glowy as a way of teaching them about how semiconductors work and how LEDs work. We've been able to use them to illustrate how energy and light work. And then some of the other work we've done is to use it to illustrate how nanotechnology works. We, we do a lot of work around the communication of nanotechnology, which is science at a very, very small scale. And because you're talking about scales beyond which you can see and beyond which you can imagine, it's sort of hard for people to get their heads around it, so doing something physical like this actually helps. So we've used the fact that LEDs glow different colours depending on the materials inside them to also illustrate how quantum dots, which are a nanomaterial, might glow different colours depending on the size of the particles. And those quantum dots can be used for medical diagnostics and for um, high performance computing. And in fact, LEDs have just been used in a, um, a nanotechnology um, development over the last few weeks, which is creating medical sutures that would light up so you could use lit sutures within the body to help guide a surgeon, for example. So it's a really good example of how we might communicate an emerging technology. If I'd gotten you, instead of attaching a paper clip to the back of it, if you'd attached a magnet, you would have made a throwy instead. Has anyone heard of a throwy? That helps a lot. <laughs> Some of you already know what I mean. So a throwy is actually an invention of the Graffiti Research Lab which is an art collective in New York. I first met um, James and Evan from the Graffiti Research Lab at the Adelaide Festival a couple of years ago. And what they do is use technology to develop new forms of graffiti. So they brought a backpack and a laser light and, and got people laser tagging buildings in Adelaide. They got 400 people along to a throwy workshop and then they went out and, 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 and tagged a whole lot of ferromagnetic buildings and they've also done the same thing in tagging trains. And um, I, I guess that's a way of challenging our ideas about what is graffiti and what is legal and also who owns public space. And if we think about this little glowy then as more than just a symbol of sustainability or a symbol of technology, it also becomes a symbol of culture, or of counterculture, in fact. And I've really enjoyed playing with the throwy, um, raiding craft stores like Spotlight to find paper clips and little scrapbooking touches for the front, um, a very feminine subversion, if you like, of what is otherwise quite a masculine idea. And the reason I can do that is because it's all licensed Creative Commons. So as long as I share openly my new recipe for a glowy with you under the same licence, I'm quite free to play with their idea. So again, there's another story in this very simple object. There's another story, and that's of a legal system of ideas and of IP. So, so far we've talked about a range of different perspectives you can get from this very simple object. We've talked about a view of the future which is environmentally focused, that the environment is the most important thing in terms of how we might approach our future, um, and that our interaction with the environment and sustainability are the sorts of things that will affect us over the next thousands of years. We've also talked about a technology perspective, you know, that the speed and scale of technology and some of the things that Mark referred to in his talk are the very things that will drive change in our future and drive the way that we will relate to each other. And of course, then there's the other view, that it's actually our ideas and the way that we relate and society that are most, the most important thing. It's the cultural perspective that will drive the way we are in the future. But you can see these are all quite disconnected. 
And it reminds me of an interview I heard with the author A.S. Byatt. She was on Natasha Mitchell's radio program, All in the Mind. And she said towards the end of that interview that she'd been invited to a workshop around cultural, cultural policy for science and technology. And she said the workshop completely broke down. And it broke down because the biologists in the room couldn't listen to the theologians. So it wasn't that they disagreed with a religious perspective. It wasn't even that. It was that they couldn't even listen to them. They couldn't even listen to them. Now, I've just written a paper for an Academic Futures journal, um, which is looking at basically a scan of all of the Academic Futures literature over the last 40 to 50 years to see what sort of images of the future um, are represented. And we do see two very distinct views. So one is a sustainability view of the future. And this is very much about going back to the land, growing our own food, living in our local area, wearing hemp clothing. And the only time that technology is mentioned in those futures is if it's public transport or renewable energy. There is nothing in those futures that talk about how we might connect, how we might communicate, what we might do for leisure, or even what we might do for health and medicine. It's non-existent. It's not that it doesn't exist, it's just not... It's just, they, don't, they don't talk about it in those futures. It's not a, not a cons consideration. The other thing that appears in the academic futures literature is a technocentric future, or as someone I was talking to about this said, ooh, all shiny and chrome. And they are, and they're all related to ideas about um, increasing amounts of technology and the human-machine interfaces where just by thinking, just by thinking, I'll be able to connect to the global internet and give you further ideas, just by thinking. But again, they're very disconnected. So why aren't we better at making integrated stories of the future? Why don't we do that better? And I've got a few examples I wanted to share about how we, how we don't do that better and why it's important that we do. So the first one relates to an article I read in the monthly um, towards the beginning of the year by Anne Mann, and the article was called Gendercide. And she talked about the fact that in some communities across the world, there was a preference for baby boys. This is important to me, I have three girls. This is Matilda. Um, and the article talked about the introduction of an ultrasound machine into one community and where you expect the introduction of that technology to improve pregnancy health and to improve infant mortality. All it did was increase the rates of early termination for girls. And whatever you might think about the moral dimension of that, it's clear that that's going to have further effects later on when you have a gender-skewed population. A good example, I thought, of, of where we introduce a technology into a context that perhaps isn't fully understood or not fully considered, and the technology does bring up further issues. And the introduction of technology will always bring up further issues. I mean, that's why you introduce it, because things change, and we need to consider how things change. We need to do that a little bit better. So we do actually need to consider various views that exist around something. But I don't mean one view and another view and representing that like we see in climate change reporting. You know, here's a perspective, here's another perspective, therefore we've given you an integrated of the future because you haven't given me an integrated view of the future. All you've done is provide two very different arguments. And I use this picture quite deliberately, one, because I get sick of smokestacks as shorthand for climate change, um, but secondly, because if you look closely, that's actually a ge geothermal, plant, uh, geothermal plant in Iceland. So the picture is always more complex than just those opposing views. I also don't mean collecting a range of views by doing empty community consultation, you know, where both parties go, around, go away completely unchanged by the experience. It has to be far more integrated. Um, this was an exercise we did with the Northern Territory on looking at the future of land use. And um, it, we were surprised how emotional it was for the participants and what sort of views that they really took away from thinking about the future and creating more integrated views of the future. I talked a little bit about introducing things out of context and only finding two opposing views and how we might more engage the community, but I don't mean doing that by clumsy compromise either. And Miriam already spoke about Murray-Darling Basin, but I think the history of that is, a, is illustrative of where we try and give a little bit of what people want to everybody and not actually build something that's far more integrated. And when we do try and do that, we get scared that people won't be happy. But we do need to create those more... Um, those better visualisations of the future. This is the Kurong a couple of weeks ago. I wanted to um, start to close out by talking about what I'd felt was a really good example of an integrated story. And it comes from some work that we were doing um, on the future of energy networks, on the future of energy. Um, and I wanted to see what the Victorian Bushfire Royal Commission might say about recommendations for energy transmission. Um, that being a, a key cause of, of some of the issues around um, Black Saturday last year. 
So I opened up the report and was expecting to read recommendation 4.3.1 suggests the removal of further something or other from the something or other, and that's not what I got. I opened the report first to see the names of the dead, and on the second page there were stories about what people had gone through that day, and those stories were striking in the richness of the context for me. It wasn't only about the environment, the weather, the pattern. It wasn't only about their relationships to place and to each other and what they tried to do because of their community relationships. It wasn't only about the, the technology and the communications they used or, or where that had failed. It was short stories that illustrated all of those things in a very integrated way. But it's a story of the past. And those stories are only done by experience. And I'm arguing we need to actually create those better stories of the future. And for all of us, there is no longer one big future. There is no long, long, longer one capital F future, as, as William Gibson um, said recently in an article, that we can all aspire to. It's fragmented. There are lots of different possibilities. But we need to start to create those more integrated images of the future, of our futures. And if I had a decent business model, I would employ a whole raft of scientists, of artists, of engineers, of animators, of coders to start to develop integrated possible stories of the future. Uh, once I've got that business model, I'll let you know, but in the meantime, that's what I'd like you to go away and do today, to challenge the assumptions you see, to challenge things when they're only viewed from one of those frames of sustainability or technology or community and culture and trying to find something which is more integrated and more infinite in its beauty and gives us more creative ways of driving change. Between the idea and the action, I'd like us to all create better future stories. Thank you.